Welcome to the New York Launch Pod, the New York Press Club award-winning podcast on your startups, businesses, and openings in the New York City area. I'm your host and New York attorney, Hal Cooper-Smith, and in this episode, we welcome back Brian Berger, the co-founder of Mac Weldon. Mac Weldon is a digitally native clothing company that has reinvented men's basics with innovative designs and unique fabrics. We last spoke to Brian in June of 2017, and since then, Mac Weldon has continued to grow expanding their clothing lines, and opening a store in Hudson Yards. When a customer has a three-dimensional experience with your brand, where they're immersed in sight, sound, motion, human interaction, um, the impression that, that, that that has is enormous. Listen to the episode to find out more about Mac Welton's continued success, their business model, and everything there is to catch up on in our series, We Call How You Doing. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. What'd you say? I'm good. Hey, you? I'm walking in. Fantastic. What's up? How you doing? So we first spoke to you in 2017. Seems like your business has grown a lot. What's changed? More people, more problems. More people, <laughs> more problems. That means growth. Yep. Um, new products. We've diversified the product offering. Uh, that's been really exciting. Customers... Uh, you know, have expressed that they want to see more from us, um, which for us was a real revelation because we kind of felt like, you know, kind of underwear, socks, and tees were like our very narrow lane and there was plenty to do there. Um, and that customers thought about us in that way, kind of category specific. But what actually ended up happening was that many of the things we were trying to achieve at the kind of core brand level, right, that were actually solving problems through innovation and design uh, and product was something that was really tra- translating with customers. So like, can you apply that formula to these other product categories that I care about? And so how did you find out that customers wanted this? Were they writing you in incessantly? Yeah, I mean, customers would write in and talk, oh, I wish I had this fabric in a t-shirt, or oh, I wish I had this sweats that were this soft, or you know, things like that. Um, or even within a category, we would, we would often hear, um, for example, when we launched the sweats program, which has become a huge business for us. It's the overall program is called ACE. Uh, we launched a sweatpant and a hooded sweatshirt. Customers were writing in immediately. Oh, I wish I had that in a half zip. And oh, I wish I had this in a crew neck. And oh, I wish I had this in a shorts version. And so we were able to get really five really interesting product lines out of one fabric investment, right? And that's like, that's really what we, what we love, really spend the time and effort on developing innovative fabrics and then scale it across multiple products. Well, it's funny that you bring up fabrics, or maybe it's not so funny, because that's what you brought up the last time. You're iterating on fabric, so you're looking at swatches of fabrics, stock fabrics, custom fabrics. You're having to come to the table with something that you feel is optimal from from that side, because a big part of our story is around fabrics. All of our fabrics are unique uh, blends. We don't take anything off the shelf. We are always kind of adding something to it. Um, to make it unique. So when you were developing the Ace sweatshirt fabric, how did you design that? So it all always starts with some level of like R&D. So, and, and usually what happens is you meet with fabric suppliers and mills and they're showing you, you know, formulations of, of fabrics, right? So it could be cotton, lycra, modal, cotton, silk, cashmere, you know, all sorts of things depending upon whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So with with sweats, it was really a French terry base. You know, that was the kind of um, overall, you know, kind of formulation and weave. Uh, But we were sort of trying to accomplish two things, a certain level of weight that was kind of an all season kind of mid weight, but also um, kind of a softness and a wow factor that when you touch it, you have a similar, you know, kind of reaction to what you have when you touch some of our kind of next to skin base layer items. So those are the two things we were looking to solve for. And then you kind of go through various cycles. You land on something and then you were usually making some level of customization to that. So maybe a little bit heavier, maybe a little bit softer, maybe a little bit more of like a peached, it's a kind of sanded feel, which is what ours has. And so when you're going through that R&D process for the fabric, how do you bring in that level of design into a 
hooded sweatshirt or sweatpants that make it different than anything you get from another fashion brand. We have uh, we have a great design team uh, led by a name a guy named uh, Matthew Congdon who um, worked for places like um, Uniqlo and and Calvin Klein and so he really kind of gets design but he also really gets fabric. Um, and for us, it's really about trying to do something that's, you know, modern and clean and unique and purposeful. And so we try and design things in a way that reflects that. So we're not going to do pockets or zippers or seams, you know, just for the sake of trying to like create some kind of design signature. Everything generally has a purpose, um, kind of all within the umbrella of, you know, certain things that we do that are specific to Mac Weldon, like where we brand the product or a certain type of stitch pattern that we use that is kind of unique to us. Those little touches, I think. You started this by saying more people, more problems. I have to imagine that one of the problems is the proliferation of online brands. And it seems like there are just so many more brands and products and people competing for attention and you're a digitally native brand. How has that landscape changed since you first started and maybe since you first came on the podcast two years ago? It's changed a lot. I mean, I think you've seen every consumer category has a digitally native brand trying to address kind of the quote unquote pain points there. And I think it's gotten a lot harder, quite honestly, to do what we've been able to do over the last, uh, I don't know, seven years, largely because of the level of competition in terms of how you access the customer. Harder uh, to start a brand. Harder to start a brand. I mean, easier in some ways and harder in some ways, right? Like easier in that there's, you know, the pump is primed for investment and, you know, kind of the next Warby Parker of whatever the category is. But it's much harder to break through and really create, um, you know, kind of customer engagement because there's so many people, not, not, just, not just people trying to, you know, kind of access customers for commercial purposes, but even just from the standpoint of like your attention span, digital content, news, podcasts, there are so many things competing for our attention. And so on the one hand, it creates more opportunities to advertise and market and position, but it also creates a lot of kind of clutter, right? And I think on some level, there's maybe a, people are getting desensitized to the Warby Parker of or the Mack Weldon of, um, because you just, it's all you hear, right? You listen to you listen to Sirius Satellite Radio, and we joke around because Mac Weldon, Third Love, uh, Tommy John, a competitor of ours, like you go straight down the line, and it's just like everybody pitching their DTC brand. So fortunately for some of the incumbents like us, you know we're operating off of you know customer mind share and a base. Uh, but if you're starting from scratch, it's very hard to like build some level of scale. I think right, and so you have that base as this environment is more cluttered. How do you acquire new customers? How are you getting through that clutter as it is now? It's always about not ever getting too complacent with your strategies and tactics. We've always been um, leaning forward on the marketing side to make sure that we're diversifying our marketing mix um, on the front end. W what are different ways we can access the customer? Podcasts are a great example of you know where we were a first mover into that channel. Um, as podcasts were gaining real kind of customer mind share and adoption, we wanted to make sure we were there, you know, diversifying our mix. Um, and the other is really uh, kind of boring, not sexy stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, that we do on the back end to make sure that when we get customers to the site, we are setting ourselves up for success from the standpoint of conversion. And we do a lot there on the digital product side of our business to ensure that we're getting maximizing customer conversion. Well, you say it's not sexy, but people want to know what, what's the magic on the back end because you said in the first interview that really is important to you. Yeah, it's all about understanding and harnessing data to make decisions. And so for us, one of the big kind of winning strategies was developing uh, landing pages that were specific to the types of creative that customers were seeing out in the world. So if we're showing you an ad about the Vesper Polo, we're dropping you onto a page that is really architected towards educating and converting you around this product and creating a minimal diversion, right? Like not 
distracting you with a whole host of other maybe awesome things, but things are going to distract you, right? Because you have a nanosecond of time that you've allocated by clicking on our ad, and we've got to make sure that we grab you in that moment. So what percentage of a direct-to-consumer brand needs to be focused on getting these customers in and serving them in the right way, the ways that you're talking about? Um, Because it seems to be a significant part in addition to product innovation. Absolutely. It's 50% of our, at least 50% of our effort is really around kind of acquiring and engaging customers for the first time and coupled with that, making sure that we create loyalty uh, over time with customers who have who have purchased from us. It's the only way to build your business, right? Because you don't have stores, you don't have wholesale deals, you are reliant on taking advantage of attributable marketing strategies and tactics to acquire and engage customers. So you talked about direct-to-consumer brands not having stores. However, one of the things that happened in the past two years since we last spoke to you is that you opened a store in Hudson Yards. Why did you decide to open up a store and why Hudson Yards? Yeah, so I, I mean, when I said we don't, you don't have stores. I'm generalizing in that as, by definition, as a as a as a digitally native brand. Presumably, you believe that the most efficient way to access and retain customers is through a largely an e-commerce relationship. But I think one of the things that is absolutely clear, and that is, you really need to be touching the consumers wherever they are. And so, for many of us that have been around for a minute or two, that is not only a kind of a handful of really smart and thoughtful third party retail partnerships or wholesale deals, but also in a case where it makes sense, direct retail, you know, opening up and, and having your own direct retail experience. And for us, it was really three things that, you know, kind of brought that to life. We were, we'd always, believed that stores or a small handful of Mack Weldon branded experiences were going to be critical to kind of the next phase of growth and and kind of brand for us. Um, Hudson Yards was really opportunistic, but it represented all of the things that were important to us. First and foremost, putting our brand in, in, a, in the path of our customer. Um, there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of our target customers coming through that place on a weekly basis. Um, and so the idea that people wouldn't have to go out of their way to get our product and experience our brand was really critically important to making kind of the retail model work for us. The second was the way in which Hudson Yards um, thinks about, uh, or the way in which Related, who's the developer at Hudson Yards, thinks about the world, which was really around creating a community and an experience that was more than just a mall or retail shops. Um, in kind of a high-end location. They're really trying to facilitate connections and community amongst the retailers there and the food and beverage and the residential community and the commercial community that's there. And so we love the potential of, um, you know, being able to take the store further and provide, you know, kind of concierge services and high next level clientele experiences for people who are there. So that was the second thing. And then the third was really the opportunity to like activate the store on a very hyper local level. Uh, New York is a major market for us. So we have the opportunity to do customer events there. We have the opportunity to do press events there. We have the opportunity to do partnerships with other retailers that are there. And so all of those things together really made, made it a no brainer for us. In addition to the fact that they were very, very enthusiastic to get us and kind of a cohort of kind of emerging brands there that didn't have a lot of physical retail presence. And you said retail experience in terms of describing your store. What do you think about as you're building a store? Because the the thing about Mack Weldon, which I found fascinating, is that you have found a problem in the market in terms of initially starting with underwear and underwear shopping, uh, which we also talked about in our last interview. But in a store setting, Stores are probably a little bit boring, stayed. People are talking about the retail apocalypse. What did you think about differently in terms of your store design to make it a retail experience? There's a few things that we do. I mean, first and foremost, our store is where we're our desire is to sell you product, right? So there's other examples of guide shops or kind of entirely experiential retail 
moments. Our, our goal was to really ensure that customers who actually show up to the store can get a lion share, the lion share of what we have there and walk out with it. If they don't want to, we'll accommodate that as well. But generally speaking, our goal is to sell you product and make sure we're exposing you to the brand just as we do on the website. So we start with doing as little as possible, keeping the merchandising as simple and straightforward as we can possibly uh, do. And so we have it set up. It's largely informed by how customers navigate the website. We have, um, you know, kind of uh, our best selling kind of underwear stories right up front. And then we have some seasonal moments and product that are relevant to kind of the time of year. And then we have, as you get kind of closer to the back of the store and the cash wrap, um, we have products like some of our accessories and socks and things you can just kind of grab when you're standing there. So just from a merchandising standpoint, it's very thoughtful and it's very data-driven based on what we see consumers doing on the website. And then we're learning over time, right? We learn that you know a product that we think is particularly seasonal isn't, right? We have a jacket called the Atlas Jacket. It's a long sleeve, full zip, you know, great kind of mid-weight uh, piece. And it's still selling really well and it's July. And so that's pretty interesting because we were thinking about taking it out, but we'd love to keep it there. It's a high priced item and customers love it. Um, and then the second is tying it together thematically. We have a art installation in the middle of the store that really reflects, you know, the Mack Weldon guy. It's kind of a three paneled fixture that is a nod to the old model car kits where you would kind of pop the pieces out. Um, and not only do we have cast molds of our products in there, we also have other items that relate to the particular uh, aspects of our guy's life. So one panel is daily uh, wear, another panel is business, and another panel is kind of active. And so it's a way of kind of not only incorporating our product in an artistic way, creative way, it also you know, we have a little fun there as well. And then we have this other thing that is just more of a customer engagement tool called Mac Man. It's a, it's a console game that we install that's a riff on Mac Man where guys can compete and play and uh, hopefully win prizes, which we run kind of on a monthly basis. Well, what I also find fascinating is that in some sense, everything old is new again. You're a direct-to-consumer brand to kind of cut out the store Yep, the retail experience, and yet now you're in stores. Specifically, why is that important to a direct-to-consumer brand and your brand? You can't uh, overstate the importance of a three-dimensional experience. When a customer has a three-dimensional experience with your brand, where they're immersed in you know uh, sight, sound, motion, human interaction, um, the impression that, that 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 has is enormous. And what we've seen from our peers and what we're seeing ourselves is that the value of customers that shop, that originate in store or shop online and in store is meaningfully higher than customers that only shop um, through e-com. And so we know that there's, you know, kind of a lift that you get just by virtue of having that kind of multi-touch experience. And so that's really a main motivator to do it. We want to make sure that we're holding all of our stores to the right kind of economic hurdles so that they're viable and that we're, we're not, you know, investing a lot of time and effort in something that isn't ultimately accretive to our business model. But there is a lot of intangible value that we'll never be able to capture, which just you know, we see in kind of the customer behavior of people who shop in store and online. And so you mentioned some of the things that are important to your store design in Hudson Yards, the art installation, having an arcade game. What were stores doing bad that are going out of business that you're trying to not do that helps you provide that lift that you talked about? I think a lot of that just has to do with the fact that if your business model is predicated on, if your growth is predicated on opening stores, then it creates a construct that makes it very difficult when things aren't going well in those stores, right? It's much harder. It's much easier for us to turn off our marketing when it becomes inefficient than it is to close stores, right? And so you have all this fixed costs. You have all this inventory. You have all this build out. You have long-term leases. You have all these things that just make it really hard to like turn off, right? And so if I'm a brand and I'm one store, five stores, 10 stores, 25 stores, 50 stores, 100 stores, and all of a sudden things start not going the right way, for me to dial that back is is really a challenge. And my whole organization, my whole enterprise is set up to facilitate store operations, not, you know, all these 
companies have websites, but their business is really oriented towards the physical retail experience. And so dialing that back and unwinding that is is hard on a number of levels. It's hard operationally. It's hard from the standpoint of you're shutting off revenue streams, even if they're inefficient revenue streams, you're actually consciously saying, I'm opting out of these revenue streams. So it just gets very hard. And then if you're public, that has additional implications. So I don't think it's so much what's happening in the actual store level. I think it just has to do with the, you know, kind of way um, many traditional retail businesses or brick and mortar retail businesses have been architected. I think if you had flexibility and optionality in leases and you could turn them on and off in a much more nimble way, the issues would be much lower, right? Than, than what, what major retailers are experiencing today. I think we have the benefit of, we don't live and die by our stores, right? So we could spend time being really thoughtful about it, right? We could spend time saying things like, we wanna put as little as possible there to create a really easy customer experience. But if you're, you know, uh, J. Crew or somebody, or Brooks Brothers, like you've got a lot of product you gotta sell through that channel. You're loading up the store, you're loading up the inventory, and you gotta do your best job to sell it. So what happens when things don't go well? You put it on sale, and now you start training the customer to like wait around for sales. And like, it just becomes a really hard thing to unwind once you start going down that path. And so for us, it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, we're opening up a store and it's doing great. But you know, if we have 10 stores that are doing really well, it's still 10% of our business, right? So like, it's not a huge deal. What are the metrics that you hold your stores to? You said there are certain economic hurdles. It's the four, four wall economics of the store. We want all of our stores to be profitable in you know in a reasonable period of time. What that is, I don't have enough basis to say. I, I can tell you that Hudson Yards will be you know handsomely profitable in the first year if things continue the way that they are. So great, great job on that. And then all of these other ancillary things, right? Like the, the behavior of customers that are in-store and online shoppers, what does their profile look like versus a customer that is purely an e-com customer? Uh, that's something that we're gonna be tracking and measuring as we kind of get into this, right? We're only a couple of months into it, but really understanding what those cohort, how those cohorts behave versus our others, and that's objective. We'll be able to measure that very clearly. And then the third is really, you know, all of the kind of, um, you know, brand activations and partnerships that we'll be able to do that hopefully result in um, not only kind of local engagement with whomever we're trying to talk to, whether it's customers or press or, um, you know, people who are shopping in the, in the, in the center, um, but also just the PR that that generates and the other uh, overall impressions that we get as a brand resulting from that. And, you know, in addition to the competition that you have from direct to consumer brands, perhaps the biggest impact that is noticeable is that the big guys are starting to mirror you a little bit. It seems like Hanes has come up with like a more comfortable boxer brief as opposed to the cardboard that they had <laughs> before. And that Banana Republic is launching a direct to consumer brand that seems to mimic your aesthetic a little bit. How has the competition from the big players in the market affected the way that you're thinking or competing with them? I think in the case of a mass market brand like Hanes, it's hard, right? I mean, I think there's customers who, I mean, we see when we survey our customers and we ask them where they're coming from, um, interestingly, and kind of to my excitement and surprise, number two on that list was Hanes. So you're talking about guys who are buying a mass market kind of low price point um, product and trading up to ours, which is like a huge, a huge thing, right? Because the opportunity there in that kind of price point is so much bigger than, for example, guys who are trading from Calvin Klein to Mac Weldon because it's more of a comparable price point. Um, <clears throat> I think it's Was that hard. number one on the list, Calvin Klein? Yeah. I think it's hard for just a mass market brand through their existing brand to kind of try and do what we've done. Uh, for a whole variety of reasons, but but mainly just because um, it's just going to be hard to kind of capture a customer who's already bought into kind of what we're selling them and then have them kind of trade back down to a brand like Hanes. Not that Hanes isn't a great brand and they haven't done amazing things over the course of time. I just think it's it's much... Uh, the opportunity for us to pull from them. And I think for them to pull from us is just going to be m much more challenging. If anything, maybe they'll create more stickiness in their existing customer base, but it just gets hard, right? Because so much of their distribution is through third parties. 
and Haynes is filling a very specific need for them and their assortment and their merchandising mix. So for them to go up price point, now they're competing with the likes of Calvin Klein, PVH, us, other you know big major licensed brands that are higher price point. And for the vertical, like for the Banana Republics of the world, I, again, I think it's being a digitally native brand uh, is hard. And I think a lot of it has to do with where you start. So it's not that any of these companies don't have the resources to launch a business like ours. It just really has to do with like what your DNA is, what your orientation is, what your talent p- profile looks like. And I just it's just harder to do. I mean, it'd be interesting to see Gap launched a athleisure brand called, I think it's called Hill City. And it'll be interesting to see what type of traction they get, you know, whether or not customers view that as authentic. Because a lot of it also has to do with the story, right? The origin story, the authenticity. Because we're able to speak directly to customers, we have the benefit of telling that story. And if people know a major corporation like The Gap is behind it, will it resonate in the same way? I don't know. How is fashion changing? Because it seems like you hit on something as you launched Mac Weldon with the basics. But there's certainly a drive to be more casual, it would seem. Goldman Sachs, you don't have to be business formal anymore. Uh, a lot of startups, I imagine people there are wearing your products. How are you thinking about fashion? How have you impacted fashion and style? And where do you see that going in the future? I guess the good news for us is we don't play really in the fashion game all that much. We think about essentials. We think about reinventing the basics, things that are kind of core to your wardrobe. Fashion, uh, luxury goods, uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how kind of millennial shoppers regard those types of brands as they mature and have more disposable income. It seems that now brands like Everlane, which what I would call kind of a fashion basics brand, you know, their story resonates a lot, primarily because of the authenticity and the story that they're telling uh, to customers. Um, what does that look like in their late 30s, 40s, and onward? Are they moving on from that and trading into the next thing? And does it start to feel like everyone reverts back to some of these more legacy brands? I'm not sure. Um, I think luxury is still seems to be you know doing really well, but I don't even know you know over time how that works, right? Because one thing I'm pretty I feel pretty strongly about is that. The whole way of shopping and department stores and these kind of massive, you know, kind of collectives of of brands driven largely by department stores, I think that model is going to really go away. And so what are you doing in addition to thinking beyond the department store to prepare for that future? What do you think about, you know? Yeah, we love, you know, we have a couple of small partnerships uh, on the retail side that, that really, I think, highlight how we think about things. I'm not sure that there's enough there to say, oh, we're going to build a gigantic business model off of this. But Equinox is a good example. They've been a close retail partner of ours since we launched. And, you know, our guys are there spending time doing other things. And so if we can, you know, be there uh, and make it more convenient for them to shop for our products or get exposure to our brand, that feels really good. They have a lot of locations. Um, it's not a place that people go to shop per se. But we have found that um, from a brand perspective and from a loyalty perspective, when customers run into us there, it creates a lot of credibility to us as a new brand. Um, and so that's been really great. Um, we've done some things with um, J. Crew, J. Crew, uh, Todd Snyder, who's a you know pretty well-known menswear designer, does, is known for collaborating with other brands, Champion, John Ver, uh, Converse, us, others. Um, so sort of kind of niche, but a lot of credibility there. Um, Stitch Fix is a big retail partner of ours, um, which, we're, which we like because they're exposing guys to brands, not just their own brands, but other brands. Uh, and so if a guy gets Mac Weldon in their box or a guy chooses Mac Weldon to be a part of their box, that's great because our assumption is that they're going to learn about us there and then, you know, come dive deeper with us directly. What about J. Crew? They seem to be on the legacy side of things. Yeah, J. Crew, uh, I would say it was 50% good, 50% bad. The 50% that was good was when we sold core Mack Weldon product there in Q4. We had a really good run um, selling our 18-hour Jersey Boxer Brief program there. Um, the other part of it was some unique product that we developed. 
which they which fit really well with them and their aesthetic. I, it didn't work out for a whole variety of reasons, um, but but mainly for us, our sort of issues were just sort of how we were positioned in the in the store. Like we we were really going for a, a major kind of visual merchandising moment, and you know again, I think they have bigger fish to fry. Quite honestly. Um, and maybe the timing wasn't so great. So I, I don't know that it's kind of off the table that we would do something again with them. But I think f- in order for us to do something with them or anybody like them, we would really need to feel very, very, very certain about how the brand was going to be positioned within that environment. And so you've come back on to the New York launch pod two years later from your first interview. Where do you see Mac Weldon two years from now, maybe five years from now? That's a great question. I, the, the two things that I think you'll see more of um, is you'll continue to see us thoughtfully diversify the offering, right? The product offering uh, into, you know, other kind of essential categories. Um, uh, and so, so there'll be some, some things happening there. I mean, you know, you wear polo shirts when it's warm and, you know, you wear Oxford shirts when it's cooler in the fall. So there are some things we have in the pipeline that are going to be interesting, but again, you know, non-fashion, you know, kind of essential items, things that guys kind of stock up on each season and really wear as kind of the part of their core uniform. Um, On the distribution side, I mean, the two big things for us are um, retail. We're having a great experience at Hudson Yards. If we could do more experiences like that in some of our key markets, our intention is to do that. Um, we see it as, as, as kind of rounding out the picture, uh, certainly domestically for the brand. And then the third is really international and how we think about bringing the brand into other markets. I mean, e-commerce really, um, you know, flattens things out. Um, and many of the things that we're set up to do digital product, digital marketing, data analytics, um, you know, all those things, uh, are core competencies of ours and, you know, the learning curve to, apply those those areas of expertise to non-US is is relatively low, right? I mean, we can extend that expertise to building businesses in those markets where there's customer appetite, where there's less, you know, kind of competition for customer mind share, and obviously a huge opportunity, right? Because these are markets that are, you know, on the rise and growing in, in some cases faster than the US. So do you want to preview any of them for our international listeners? Uh, well, Australia and New Zealand are first on our list um, for a, a bunch of reasons, but they make it really easy, you know, shipping and fulfillment and duties and things like that, that create a hurdle. Um, and then of course, Western Europe is, is pr- particularly interesting for us. And then on from there. Well, that is a wonderful note to end things on. Brian Berger, thank you for stepping back on the New York Launch Pod and sharing your time with us. Thank you so much for having me. Congrats on all the success. How we're do, both still here. We're, so bo- that's we're both thing. still here. Right. How do people find out more about Mac Weldon? What do you want to pitch? www.macweldon.com, M A C K W E L D O N, as well as Hudson Yards. We're on the second floor. It's called the Floor of Discovery. Um, we're in a great spot right in between Beta and Citarella and Blue Bottle Coffee. So, um, right in kind of one of the main corridors uh, in the most exciting area of the, of, of, of the shopping center. And if you want to learn more about the New York Launch Pod, you can follow us on social media at NY Launch Pod and visit nylaunchpod.com for transcripts of every episode, including this one. And if you're a super fan, Brian Berger, are you a super fan of the podcast? Absolutely, yeah. If you're a super fan like Brian Berger, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It is greatly appreciated and does help people discover the show. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New York Launch Pod. For more information, please visit nylaunchpod.com.